Listen for the word of God in the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 33 to 39. Some people said to Jesus, The disciples of John fast often and pray frequently. The disciples of the Pharisees do the same, but your disciples are, off, are always eating and drinking. Jesus replied, You can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? The days will come when the groom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. Then he told them a parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment to patch an old garment. Otherwise, the new garment would be ruined, and the new patch wouldn't match the old garment. Nobody pours new wine into old wineskins. If they did, the new wine would burst the wineskins, the wine would spill, and the wineskins would be ruined. Instead, new wine must be put into new wineskins. No one who drinks a well-aged wine wants new wine, but says the well-aged wine is better. Here ends the lesson. So we continue with our um, study with Matt Rawls' book on what makes a hero. And our theme for today is Old, New, and Covenant. The, um, I think it's most important to talk about what is a covenant. A covenant in its most um, simple state is a promise, right? Um, I pulled this definition off of Wikipedia, a solemn promise to engage in or refrain from a specified action. Um, we make covenants with one another. When we get married, we don't usually call them covenants, we call them vows. We, set, we exchange vows. When we bring a new person into the community, which at 1045 is going to be via baptism, at baptism we make a covenant, we make promises. The parents will make promises to, raise, to bring that child to church, to, to bring them around us so that we can help to form their faith. But we also promise to be there for them, right? To, to support them. This idea of old and new, though, in our culture and in our society, we have this obsession with new. And thinking that the new, like the latest and greatest, is always better than the old. Even though... Reality says that's not always true. The new isn't always better. But sometimes we need the wisdom that's been gained from the old to go with some of the newer parts. So today we're going to look at some covenants. The covenant is also a really important word for the United Church of Christ. The United Church of Christ, which is a newer uh, denomination, as denominations go, took old, some old denominations, four as a matter of fact, and put them together. And in the process of that, we, had, we held on to um, a value of autonomy. Everybody likes the value of autonomy in the United Church of Christ because that's the one that says that we as a congregation have the right and ability to choose how we will run our church. We do not have, our denomination does not tell us how it's going to be. We get to make some choices ourselves. But that autonomy... It's not just autonomy. It's not just about being free. It is autonomy within our relationship with the other churches, within the covenant. And our own Don Freeman 
wrote this piece about this relationship between covenant and autonomy. In every unit of the church, while in covenant with the other units, has a non-transferable responsibility to discern and respond to the call of God to it, God's will and way for it, in its time and place. So we have the freedom to discern what God is calling us to do in this time and place as this body of Christ gathered. But we do so recognizing that we're in relationship with other churches. And so we want to do that so that, so that we maintain those relationships, right? With the blessing of freedom comes responsibility. That's true when we look at God's covenants with God's people too. So let's look at a few. The first covenant is Noah and the flood. And I put the, the scripture references up there. Um, if you ever want to look them up or if you want to jot them down, look them up later. But So when we think about Noah... The covenant came after the flood. And we have the promise that God will never, my words, not the, not the scripture, um, but my own paraphrase, God will never destroy all of life again. That's God's promise to us. That God will never clear the earth of all life. The next promise is to Abraham and Sarah. To Abraham and Sarah, God promises to, make, to give them more descendants. Because remember, they didn't have any children and they were worried about that. And God says, I'm going to give you more descendants than there are stars in the sky. And you will be my people and I will be your God. And then he told them that he's going to give them the land from the Egypt, river of Egypt to the Euphrates. Again, with this sense that you will be my people and I will be your God. And then Moses, when he brought the people out of Israel, at Mount Sin uh, out of Egypt, and they were in the, in the wilderness, at Mount Sinai, God made another covenant with God's people. God said that I will create... A, whole, a nation of you. You will be a holy nation. If or <laughs> you obey my ten commandments. So more responsibility. More blessing. I will bring you together and I will, I will take you to the land of milk and honey. I will take you to the promised land. And you will follow the ten commandments. And then there's da King David. King David was given a promise, a covenant, that God would create this one nation under David's monarchy. They would be a united force. We are, we, I didn't talk about that with, the, with our denomination, but our denomination talks about being a uniting United and uniting church. We are about creating relationship. God promised David that he would help them create this relationship, that they would be one nation under David's rule and David's family's rule. Well, all of that blessing and responsibility... And we still didn't get it right. We couldn't keep up our end of the relationship. But fortunately, God did not give up on us, right? God instead came and became one of us in Jesus. God came to be our rabbi. To help us understand and, and remind us of God's story and fulfill it. 
And so we hear about covenant from Jesus. We hear about covenant in the, in the Last Supper. The children sang about the bread and the cup. Because God said, Jesus said, that this cup is the cup of the covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. God was willing to give his own blood for our forgiveness. Because God still, even though we always failed to meet our responsibilities and God's expectations, God kept reaching out to us. It's interesting, actually, in the communion liturgy that Mark, Matthew and Mark just say this is the cup of the covenant. But Luke calls this the new covenant. And it's important to know that because Luke was talking to people who were not Jewish. They didn't feel like the covenant applied to them because they didn't have the history of all the other covenants. For in, to Luke, Jesus opened the covenant, the old covenants, to include everyone, not just the house of Israel, not just the Jewish folks, but those who were coming into Christianity, who were, start, who were believing in Jesus. They, too, were welcome at the table. This cup was poured out for them also. Everyone is welcome. In this way, Jesus opened. Jesus opened the covenant. More than new. We call it a new covenant. But, but more than new verses old, Jesus opened the covenant. He was uniting people. He was making more people welcome, not less. And then we have, so we have this parable of the wineskin. This is from Luke also. Not surprising because we know that Luke's agenda is to um, help these people that he's talking to, under, that he wrote to, understand that they too are part of of God's people, that they are God's people and God will be their God. And he uses a parable like he often does. At that time, wine was the traditional drink and it was always stored in wineskins. So he's taking two things that are very common that they're used to thinking about and wine was a symbol of life, right? So it's interesting, too, that, they, that he pulls the blood and the, and the wine together because we also think, we still think of blood as part of life, right? Because without blood, you don't live. That's just, that's, a, that's really extra simplistic biology there, right? You have to have blood. Well, they looked at, at the wine, as part of a, a symbol of life, of creation's life, and the new life that could be, that could be. even from that which looks like, I mean, because it's from fermented grapes, right, which normally would be a, a bad thing, but from fermented grapes comes new life, comes good life. But this idea of the new wine in old wineskins I think it has a lot to do with these new followers and the apostles and the others who had experienced Jesus. They had a hard time still fitting in to the old church, to the Jewish synagogue. And the Pharisees, who, got rid of, who helped to get rid of Jesus to begin with, we're not particularly excited about having them come back and talk about this Jesus who was the Messiah when they didn't think he was. 
this, the, the way they talked about Jesus and the, and the experiences of Jesus, it was mind-blowing for the Pharisees. So rather than become one faith, we became two. The new wineskin, like the new church, which became Christianity. Jesus didn't come to create a new faith. Jesus came to help call us back to God. But we are the ones who couldn't manage it. And so we divide. Just as Christianity has continued to divide and, and Judaism has has divided in some ways also. Because we still have different ideas of how God really relates to us. But the bottom line is that Jesus is our superhero. That's part of, of what we say, in, <laughs> not in those words, um, as the United Church of Christ. What makes us the United Church of Christ is that Jesus is the sole head of the church. Jesus is the center. Jesus is the one that we look to for our direction. And we remember not just the new covenant or the way God, Jesus expanded it, but we remember the old also. We remember that we are called to be God's people. But we are called to be God's people, and God will be our God. But we're called to do that in a way that opens the church, that welcomes more people. And that, for some of us, is a change. Our superhero for today is Captain America. I hope you saw some of the... The kids made Captain America shields last Wednesday, and some of them had their, their Captain America shields with them this morning. Um, unfortunately, we didn't talk much about Captain America, but they had their shields. Um, Captain America is the alter ego of Steve Rogers. So here's my little background information for those of you that are not comic people like I obviously have proved myself to be. Um, actually, I'm a movie buff. So Captain America, or Steve Rogers, lives in 1940, in the 1940s. He's getting out of high school. And he has, and his bu buddy, um, Bucky Barnes, um, want to go and do their part for the war. And so they try to enlist in the Army. Well, Bucky is this really fit athlete, and the Army takes him in a heartbeat. And Steve Rogers is short and thin and weak and not what the Army is looking for. But they look at him and say, but we've got a deal for you. We're creating a super soldier. Will you sign up? And he wants in the army so much that he agrees, for which they do all kinds of things that we don't know, but probably were not good for his body. And he comes out looking like Chris Pine <laughs> with quite the body and the muscles and the speed and the strength. And he's given his shield, which is almost impervious. Um, He gets sent, though, on his mission where he thinks he's going out to fight like his buddy Bucky. Instead, they put him uh, on a tour with some, some, like, rockets to sell war bonds, which he is less than thrilled about. That's not what he wants to be doing. Finally, he gets a chance to go to Germany. And while he's there, he finds out that his buddy is behind enemy lines, and he and the, the group that he's with are not supposed to make it out. And he says, you got to let me go. And he goes. <laughs> he doesn't actually get permission to go, but he has some friends that get him there, and he brings out this whole command, the 110th uh, command, and 
Um, and he saves his buddy, Bucky, who was starting, they were starting to um, do some experiments. The Germans were starting to do some experiments on Bucky. But he saves Bucky, which is the picture on the top when, they, when he and Bucky lead the group back to the Americans. And life is good. Now, unfortunately, they haven't really conquered the Americans or, in their world, Hydra. Um, and this ends up with him fighting Hydra and him ending up at the bottom of the ocean for 70 years. He comes out, he's found after 70 years, and he comes back to be an Avenger. And in the course of the Avenger, he runs into his next nemesis, which is the Winter Soldier. And the Winter Soldier happens to be Bucky Barnes, his best friend. Except now he's working for the bad guys. And he has to actually fight Bucky. He has, technically he has to defeat Bucky, is what the, what the Americans want him to do. Um, they want him to stop Bucky. But Steve knows that if he can just get Bucky, if he can talk to him, he can turn him. He knows that he will bring him back. And there is a point while they are battling that he gets... Bucky to look at him without, they, everybody takes the masks off and he looks at him and he says, I will be with you to the end of the line. And that was a phrase, that was a covenant that they had made back in the 40s before either of them had gone to war. I will be with you to the end of the line. Just like the covenant that God makes with us. God will be with us till the end of the line because God is the end of the line. That's the good news, right? That's the good news. God is the end of the line. So the question is, how do we allow the change to take place? Like Jesus changed the covenant by opening the covenant, can we change ourselves by opening ourselves to more people, to more friends, to, to people we don't know, to people who may not look like us or dress like us or act like us? Can we be like Jesus and open that up, open the church up, open this congregation up and still know that we are God's people and God will be our God. The covenant remains. The covenant remains. But now, the covenant that we celebrate in our sacrament is a covenant of forgiveness. That there is nothing that we can do that we can do or anyone else can do that can separate us from the love of God that we know in Christ Jesus. May we be Christ's people. May we go out to be sharing Christ's love with all. Amen.